Thank you, Mrs. Mitchell. What a tremendous truth, tremendous song. Well done. Thank you this morning. If you have your Bibles, open to Esther chapter number 9. Esther chapter number 9. As we finish this morning our series on Esther and the book of Esther, our theme for this year is I Believe God. You say that with me. Our theme for this year is I Believe God. In case you forget, it's on the screen behind me, on the screens, on the side auditorium, and the big printed thing there as well. So just in case you miss it when you walk in, you'll see our theme for this year, which is I Believe God. We looked at Paul early on in the year with the storm and what God did there. We looked at Daniel and what God did there. And then we spent some time now looking at Esther. Part of the reason why I want to bring Esther is because I wanted to show um, a particular book dedicated to a lady who changed the course of an entire nation. All right, God used her. I don't want you to think for a moment that God can't use you wherever you're at in life. But pastor, I'm just at home. I'm just doing this, just doing that. There is no just doing in God's economy. We serve God and God takes who we are. He makes us something better. And He can take the little things that we have, little talents that we don't realize He wants to use. And when we put them in His hands, He does something great. And that's what He did with Esther. Remember the key verse. She was there for such a time as this. Right now in 2020, we are here for such a time as this. There are people around you where you work, where you go and buy your groceries, where you get your gasoline, who need the the witness of the gospel, who need Jesus Christ, and you are there for such a time as this. And I choose, I hope you choose, to believe God. I hope as a church we choose to believe God, believe Him with our life, believe Him with our eternal destination. And if you're not saved today, I hope you pray that you would get saved. Trust Him and believe Him with your wallet. Believe God. We come now to the end of the account in Esther chapter 9. There's just 9 and 10. And some verses I want to focus on Esther chapter 9, verse beginning in verse number 17. At this point, God wins, good triumphs, and evil has lost. At this point, it's an amazing time. At this point, there is not a real threat. At this point, God has turned bad days into good days. At this point, God has shown himself strong on the behalf of his people. At this point, there is now rejoicing that we'll see. At this point, there is feasting that we'll see. At this point, there is everything good where before it was all bad. At this point, in this part of the story, life is good. Esther chapter 9, beginning verse 17, on the 13th day, of the month of Dar, and on the 14th day of the same, rested they. In a sense, they finally sat down. They didn't have lazy boys back then, about 350 or so um, B.C., but if they would have had lazy boys, they would have sat in them at this point right here. They didn't have Diet Coke, but not a doubt in my mind, they would have pulled out the Diet Coke at this point when they rested. Now, some of you don't like Diet Coke, and I pray Lord touch your heart this morning. Just in a side note, I gave up Diet Coke. I like Diet Coke. I gave it up for a long while. People said, listen, give up Diet Coke. You'll lose 30 pounds in one year if you don't drink Diet Coke. They say Diet Coke is an acquired taste, and once you stop drinking it, you touch it again, you'll hate the stuff. They lied to me. <laughs> they lied. I stopped for, what, three, four or more months. Not a single pound moved off my body. After that time, I saw Diet Coke, and I said, well, I'm going to try it again. And I liked it just as much as before. If you don't like it, well, there's still hope for you. They rested. And they made it a day of feasting and gladness. Can you imagine their smiles on their faces and a spring in their step? Can you see that there? They're resting and they're feasting and gladness. It goes on to describe verse 18 what happens. But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day thereof. And on the 14th thereof. And on the 15th day of the same, they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness. The 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. They kept on coming back together to rejoice and to enjoy what God had done. Did did you get the idea that this is a happy occasion in their lives? Of course it is, because they were destined to be exterminated, to be slaughtered, yet God had turned it around. Of course it was a day of gladness, and they kept on rejoicing. It kept on going 13th, 14th, and the 15th. 
Verse 19, Therefore the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unwalled towns made the 14th day of the month of Dara a day of gladness and feasting and a good day and of sending portions one to another. Now they're sending things to each other. Verse 20, Mordecai wrote these things and sent letters unto all the Jews that were in all the provinces, 120 of the king Ahasuerus, both nigh and far, to establish this among them, that they should keep the 14th day of the month of Dar and the 15th day of the same yearly, as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies, and the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy, and from mourning into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy, and of sending portions one to another, and gifts to the poor. This morning, the Lord's help. I want to look at this concept. What happens after a blessing? I've entitled the message, Remembering the Goodness of God. What happens after a blessing? What happens next? We have all, all experienced God's blessings in our lives. All of us. If you're sitting here breathing today, that is a blessing, a gift from God. But that's not where it starts, right? We are blessed, infinitely blessed. What happens after we are blessed? How quickly we forget what God has done. How quickly we come to the what has God, God done for me lately attitude. How quickly we move on from a blessing to complaining. How quickly we change our sorrow to gladness back to bitterness again. Because yes, God worked last week, but this week I have this issue. Remembering the blessing of God. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your word. Lord, I pray you challenge us this morning through your spirit and through your word. Lord, touch our hearts. Help me to say those things that I ought to say. Lord, I need your help this morning. I cannot preach without you. Lord, would you meet with us? Would you touch us? Help us to respond to you. And Lord, may it be uh, an eternal change. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here, either in the auditorium or online, who has never trusted you as their Savior, that today they would not leave and would not finish the service without praying and trusting you as their, as their Savior. Lord, we ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. We quickly change from what have you done for me lately from thank you lord you can see it sometimes illustrated with small children i'll use my kids for an example they're not in here one of the rules of being a pastor's kid is anything you say can and will be used against you in the next sermon <laughs> just the way right, brother Trevor, just the way it works so johnny james and daniel you better live right in the, in the howell household or else it'll be right here i said no 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 but you know how it is with kids right you can do wonderful things. And a few years back at Christmas time, we love to celebrate Christmas in a big way. And we usually give a lot of gifts at Christmas time, is the way I grew up. And I love to see just presents piled all around the tree. All right, Santa Claus brings them. And uh, we noticed that day, the kids were real young at that point, that, that very quickly they'd open a present, something that we had spent time choosing and time, you know, getting money for and time wrapping. All right, that's the hardest part of Christmas, is it not? And uh, what would happen is they'd open up one present. And almost as quick as they get that unwrapped, what happens? They run to the next present. And as quick as that one's done, they're to the next present and to the next present. And, and my brothers and sisters, their aunt and uncles are very generous to them. So they're having just a pile of presents and their grandparents. I mean, they just have a, a load of presents and it is like sensory overload. We get done with that Christmas and they get all done. And, and as foolish parents, we had bought these presents and there our kids sit playing with a box. I could have saved a whole heap of time just getting some cardboard boxes from the back of Kroger. And they ran and ran here. What do I have next? Do you know that, Christian, you and I can be, you, be guilty of the exact same thing? God blesses us. He answers a prayer request. He touches our life and, and brings something amazing. And it seems as if, if we're not careful, almost immediately we're on to the next problem. Seemingly forgetting what God has just done in our life. We had a blessing last week. My wife and I were trying to sell a few things and some projects done. We sold a trailer last week, last Sunday afternoon between church. We sold a trailer. 
I had prayed that morning, Lord, and the day before, Lord, I really want to save this, to, to sell this trailer. And the Lord answered my prayer request. He answered it. How quick can God answer prayer requests, and yet we're like back to the drawing board, and it seems like we just come back with our greedy, outstretched hands. Not in the sense of God, pour your blessings, because we're allowed to come boldly. But if we're not careful, we forget the blessings of God, and we don't remember the goodness of God. We get a complaining and a bitter attitude and we wake up the next day and our car has a flat tire or our car won't start and nobody likes a car that will not start or even worse than that, our toilet won't flush. And no one likes septic problems on the top of that list. How quickly can a non-flushing toilet snatch from my spirit, my heart, the blessings and goodness of God? How quickly can a little situation, you walk in the office and someone has a cross word and instantly your whole day is blown up, forgetting about all that God has done, all that he has accomplished in your life, all that he has worked, all the ways he's answered. We forget the goodness of God. As I come to the end of Esther, I was struck, I was struck by how they put some things into place to help them remember the goodness of God. I could use three points today. I could make them all the same letter. It's called alliteration. They could be content and committed and contrite or satisfied, serve and sorry. They could be pleased and perform and be penitent. But today I want to give you three statements about the goodness of God I find in this passage that I think will be helpful to us. Hopefully they help to you in your life. Because maybe you're like me, that sometimes the problems of life tend to snatch the remembrance of God's goodness. Or am I the only one? No, I'm probably not. I want to notice, first of all, that we ought to, first of all, Christians ought to be and should be satisfied with the goodness of God. Christians should be satisfied with the goodness of God. I look at this passage in verses 17, 18, and 19. And I see them rejoicing, not wishing for more. They were saying, oh, man, I wish God had really worked in this situation. No, they were just rejoicing, or they were satisfied with what God had done. You know that, that if we're not careful, we will not be satisfied with what Jesus does? They were, first of all, satisfied with the process you know that God's process is usually different than your process or my process? Sometimes, if I'm not careful, sometimes if you're not careful, you don't like the way God brought this about in your life. You say, God, I would rather you had brought this blessing this way, not this way. And, and we are, have to be careful to be satisfied with the process that God works. We're tempted to complain because of the process that God takes. We're tempted to complain because we don't like His methods. We're tempted to complain because, well, the blessing's nice. It just sure took him a long time to do it. God, why couldn't you show up earlier? Would have been easier for me. We're all about me, right? The Jew was satisfied with the goodness of God. We had to be satisfied with the process. I could not help but think about a man who had an amazing ministry by the name of Ron Hamilton or Patch the Pirate. I lost his eye to cancer. And because of that process, because of that process, God brought a blessing of a ministry that has touched thousands upon thousands of people with songs and messages about God. We've got to be careful that we don't become dissatisfied with the process, but also we usually want the blessing without the process. Lord, give us a day of feasting and gladness, but don't allow a Haman into my life. Well, the reason there was a feasting and day of gladness was because of Haman, all right? We don't like what God has allowed in there. God didn't raise up Haman. Haman made his own choices, but God used it and he brought the victory. We don't want to have any hardship. We somehow think, because we trust Christ or because we're pretty good people, that no hardship should come. Our roof should never leak. Why? Oh, our roof is leaking. Oh, my goodness. And this is what happened. This is what we say. My roof's leaking, and I just put my offering in the plate. Kind of like that if I put an offering in the plate, my roof should never leak. Right? 
I, here I am, picking up kids on a bus. And now my clothes are messed up. And if I wasn't picking up kids on the bus, my clothes wouldn't be messed up. See, I'm serving God. I shouldn't have any hardship in my life. Or you get hit on the way to church. See, if I wasn't going to church, my car wouldn't have been hit. Because somehow if I go to church, then God will never let me have any hardship in my life. But can you not see that there's blessings in, in everything that God does? He brings blessings to us. He brings and shows his goodness to us. Remember one time I saw years ago a clip. It was a little cartoon. It had a husband and wife in, in a vehicle. And they had little bubbles above their heads. I don't remember whose bubble was above which head. But it shows a perspective on this. And under, over the one bubble, it said, man... Every time I get an extra $500, something breaks. And over the other person's head, this little cartoon, the bubble said, the bubble read, Wow, before something breaks, God always sends $500. Perspective. Perspective. We begin to complain, but because of the, the process that God brings us through, we don't want any hardship. We don't think we deserve any hardship, but we ought to be satisfied with the goodness of God. Satisfied with the process, but satisfied with the product. I look around and I see well-kept people. I look at the parking lot and I see vehicle upon vehicle, Right? If I was to go home with you, many of you would have another two or three vehicles, would you not? Beautiful houses. Many of you will have a lavish lunch today, and if you go out, you'll go to a restaurant of your choosing, will you not? I remember a while back when this struck me as I was going to get a Starbucks coffee. I thought, what a blessing. I can go through Starbucks and buy a bitter cup of coffee whenever I want to. Whenever I want to. What a blessing. I had the privilege of being in Ghana in January. We were riding with one of the young men there. Boy, just an outlook on life that would challenge all of us. He's excited. Jumped into his vehicle. Five of us in a car the size of a Geo Metro. Geo Metro being a lot, almost uh, about one and a half bicycles, probably. I climb back into my truck when I get back here. I'm blessed. Satisfied with the product. But you know what happens to us? We see, uh, we receive a blessing from God, and then someone else gets a little bit nicer blessing. A little bit bigger house. A little bit newer car. A little bit better deal at the store. And all of a sudden, the blessing that we had pales in our mind in comparison to what God did for them. Huh. God only loves me this much, He only gave me this vehicle. I only got this many square feet. I only got this kind of deal. You see how we have to be satisfied with the, the product because the minute that we begin to walk down that road, the goodness of God, the blessings of God are snuffed, ripped out of our minds. What well, years ago that a family came, they had a brand new car, brand new car. Told the dad, man, I am so excited for you. And he, with tears in his eyes, said, Pastor, thank you for saying that. Well, Pastor Judy, thank you for saying that. I was a little bit taken back by that. I mean, you have a nice vehicle, I'm happy to say it looks nice. And I said, well, sure. He said, you won't believe how many people here, you meant here, gave sideways, glasses, sideways glances and said things like, well, it must be nice to have a car like that. You know why we're guilty of that, Christian? And we all have that temptation. Well, I'm not above that. We all have that temptation. It's because of this right here. We're not satisfied with the product that God brings. Oh, Lord, what you brought was really nice, but I just saw, man, I just saw their chainsaw. And I have a 20-inch blade, but they have a 24-inch blade. I liked my truck until I saw their truck. Ladies, I, I like this. We all can be guilty of it. Paul says in Corinthians, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Find out that we ought to be satisfied. We should be satisfied with the goodness of God. If we're going to have the remembrance of God's goodness, we've got to be satisfied with it. Say, Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you for answering my request. Lord, look what you did for me, for my family, for my wife, for the church. Boy, we look around and we can see it all over the place, but I see something else. 
Verse 27, a little further on the passage. The Bible says that the Jews ordained. The Jews ordained in chapter 9, verse 27, and took upon them and joined upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them. So as it should not fail that they would keep these two days according to their writing and according to their appointed time every year. And that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city. And that these days of Purim should not fail among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. Not only should we be satisfied with the goodness of God, we should be committed because of the goodness of God. Let me explain what's happening right here. These Jews have now made a decree to them and to their seed that they would forever, from this moment on, celebrate, celebrate what God has done. They've committed a few ways. First of all, they've committed to rehearse. You see, the goodness of God should cause me to speak about the goodness of God. A question for you, my friend. Are you poor in mouth or is your mouth full of praise? Too often, we're quick to complain rather than praise our God. This is what God has done. Isn't God good? Or maybe we can be positive about what God has done. Well, Pastor, you're just a kind of glass, uh, half full kind of guy, aren't you? No, I'm not. But my God is a completely full glass kind of God. And I want to talk about it. I want to tell you what God has done, how he has worked the problem is that we only assign, we assign only average marks to our God. We assign our God average marks. Lord, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Lord, that was a pretty good blessing. The Jews here, they assigned God high marks and gave him high praise. Lord, this is wonderful. And they rehearsed it. He is great, greater than any being, greater than any problem, greater than my needs, greater than my fears. God is greater than anything else in the world. That's why in Lamentations, the writer said, the Lord is my portion. Therefore will I hope in Him. You know what you ought to do? You ought to talk about the goodness of God. Let me make it plainly. Let me speak plainly. Talk to your spouse about what God has done. Talk to your neighbors about what God has done. Talk to your co-workers about what God has done. Talk to fellow Christians about what God has done. Instead of complaining, talk about the goodness of God. This past week, I was praying for something else. The Lord answered a different prayer request for me. I was talking to somebody and explaining how, how God answered this prayer request. They were trying to explain away what God had done. But I wouldn't let him off that easy. I said, no, God worked this way. God worked this way. Talk about the goodness of God. The thing is, we talk a whole lot about sports. We talk a whole lot about politics. If we spent as much time talking about Jesus as we do about politics, this world would be turned upside down. If you would post on your social media more about Jesus and God, than politics, this world would be turned upside down. What I'm saying is they committed to rehearse, to talk about the blessings of God. They said, listen, everyone's going to know about this. Our seed will know about this. Talk to your God. Talk to your, to your wife, to your family. Talk about what God has done. What kind of blessings do you have? Well, I got a whole list of them. I've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. What a blessing. I'm part of a tremendous church. What a blessing. I have a loving and faithful wife. And what a blessing. I have a family. I have a house. I have a strength. I have a health. I have finances. I have limited abilities. But I can walk and I can talk. I can talk about the blessings of God. I have friends. I have mercy and grace shown to me. I have the blessings of God. How about you? How about you? You ever had the mercy of God in your life? I've done stupid. What stupid have you done, Pastor? I'm not telling you all the stupid things I've done. And don't ask my wife. She may tell you. <laughs> she may tell you. Aren't you glad for the mercy of God? Talk about His goodness. Talk about His goodness. Not only did they commit to rehearse, they committed to remember. They said, to ever, for, forever after our seed, we'll do this. They were committed to establish what God had done. And they tell me that each year now, on March the 9th, March the 10th, or this last year was March 9th and 10th, was the day that the Jews in 2020 celebrated 
the Feast of Purim. This year they celebrated this feast. And they have done that for almost 24 or so hundred years. It started back here when the book was written. We can find outside documentation, like not just the Bible, outside documentation from 500 A.D. and on. So even then, call it 1,500 years. 1,500 years they get together and they celebrate what God has done. That's a commitment. How long do your commitments last? Hello, New Year resolutions, right? It lasts four days, five days, 1,500 years they get together. And we've talked throughout the story about some of those things. They do almost the same thing. They have the same celebration. They have the same reactions for fifteen or 2,400 years. That's a commitment. When we see the goodness of God, it ought to cause us to be committed. To be committed to remember. I write things down. Every time I write my, my journal in the morning, I write down blessings before I write down prayer requests. You know why? Because I forget. But I do love turning back the pages. Say, wow, that's right. That's right. This is what God did yesterday, because today was pretty heavy. This is what God did last year. You know when you read that, you remember? When I, at least when I do, I read that blessing from a year ago. And I'm taken back to that day. I, don't, I remember some of the circumstances and, and maybe some of the heaviness I felt before the prayer request. And it's like, wow. And then I'm encouraged. Because the Lord is my portion. I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged because I'm able to remember. So make some commitments to remember to remember what God has done, to cause those around us to know what God has done, to take some time each day to identify. You don't have to write things down. You ought to. Maybe, maybe you ought to. You could do it as you drive to work. Lord, this will be my blessing time. I'm going to drive to work. I'm going to talk about what you've done and thank you for what you've done in my life. And every day have a blessing time, remembering the goodness of God. And then a commit, a commitment to rejoice. A commitment to rejoice. Notice this verse, just a, almost an ending to it in chapter 10, verse number 3. End of the entire book, last verse of the book. The Bible says, For Mordecai the Jew was next unto King Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted, here it is, of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people and seeking peace to all his seed. Oh, did you catch what happened with, with Mordecai? He was accepted of the multitude of the brethren, but not all of them. Not all of them were happy with Mordecai. Remember, Mordecai was a key player in this account, was he not? He was exalted. You know, commit, a commitment to rejoice, because I hate to tell you, but sometimes people aren't going to be happy when God blesses you. And it's the people that ought to be blessed. The people, the Jews, that did not appreciate Mordecai were still saved because of Mordecai's role in this. All right, God did it, but he used Mordecai, did he not? And, and, and they, even though they were blessed by it in the process, they didn't accept it. it happens, doesn't it, Christian? Family members, fellow Christians, happens. But there's a commitment to, to rejoice, and Mordecai still sought the peace Romans tells us, rejoice that them rejoice and re reap with them that weep. Sometimes people still won't like you, but stay committed. They probably wouldn't like Jesus either. Sometimes the people who ought to like you won't like you, but stay committed. Because our commitment ought to flow from what God has done, not what others think. We should be satisfied. We should be committed. But last of all, we should repent because of the goodness of God. In chapter 9, verse 27, the Bible says that the Jews ordained and took upon them and upon their seed and upon all such as joined themselves unto them. Because of what God had done, others, we saw that a little bit last week in, in chapter number 8, verse 17, because of what God had done, the goodness of God, others came to worship God. Reminds me of Romans chapter 2. 
where it says, Or despisest thou the riches of his, God's goodness, and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. You know what the goodness of God ought to do in your life and my life? Lead us to be a better Christian, a better child of God. The goodness of God ought to cause us to serve God more, not less. The goodness of God ought to cause our hearts to be turned more toward God, not away from God. It should lead us to repentance. The goodness of God ought to be attractive to have others repent. That's what God's done for you? Wow, tell me more about this God you speak of because you seem to be all in with that. How is your testimony to others? If they listen to what you say, would they want to become a Christian? Would they want to see what God could do in your life or in their life because He's done in your life? I'm afraid that because of our speech, we turn others away rather than entreat them, invite them to come. The goodness of God should lead to repentance not only in my life, but in the lives of those around me. Mom and Dad, I hope your kids are excited about serving God because you love serving God. I hope your kids are excited about praying to see God work because as parents, you've helped them see that. It was years ago, a man I was on staff years ago by the name of Bill Swain. We're riding a car up to camp and pray for us. We're going to camp this week. We're going to school camp. Bill and I were going to school camp. In his car, I think it was a Lincoln Town car he had then. And he said, J.D., when you're, when you're dad, it was a long way off. They didn't even know Doreen at this time. It was a long way off then. He said, make sure, he said, that you yeah, let your kids see God work. He went on to explain what he meant by that. He said, you know what, you're going to be tempted to shield them from everything. I'm not saying you, you share every hardship with them, but he said, don't, don't shield them from seeing God work. So as a family, we will pray for something. All right, it's not just on my shoulders, but it's on his shoulders. And as a family, we'll join together and pray so they can see the goodness of God, so that they turn toward God. Repentance, turning toward him. The goodness of God should cause us to repent. Oh, he gave us his goodness and salvation. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. That goodness should cause us to repent. And if you're here and never trusted Jesus Christ, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God, the gift is goodness, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And by praying and trusting in him, he'll give you a home in heaven. But my friend, if you're a Christian here today and you've trusted Christ, maybe, just maybe, you've gotten off track with the goodness of God. God has been good to you, no doubt about it. He can't be anything but good. God is good, as they often say, the response, all the time. But sometimes that's just a little catchy phrase. And in our heart, we think that's the furthest thing from the truth. Remember the goodness of God today? Have you seen Him work in your life? Have you been satisfied with it? Have you been committed because of it? Have you turned others to him because of his goodness? The Jews had a great ending. I love it. I love the book of Esther. But they didn't stop just there. They did some things with that. And now, for over 2,000 years, still celebrate, still celebrate the goodness of God. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for your goodness. Lord, you blessed myself, you blessed each one of us in so many ways. Lord, help us not to be tempted to complain or be distracted. Lord, help us to be turned towards you. I wonder this morning, with our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here, maybe God touched your heart this morning. Perhaps you've seen the goodness of God, but it's not been on the forefront now. You've seen God's working and seen Him answer prayer, but... You've been overwhelmed by other things. What if you say, Pastor, would you pray for me? As you spoke, God spoke to me today. And I need to return in my remembrance of the goodness of God. I need to remember what he's done. I need to be satisfied with what he's done. And I've allowed other things, other thoughts maybe to dominate. Would you pray for me this morning? That I would keep the goodness of God in my mind and on my lips. 
and say, Pastor, what you spoke, God spoke to me. Would you pray for me today? Would you lift your hand up? Amen. Amen. Who else? Would you pray for me while you pray for us? Amen. Amen. I wonder if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. But if you died today, you don't know that you'd go to heaven. My friend, we'd love to open a Bible and show you how you can know for sure. We'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me when you pray for the others? I'll call no more attention to you than did anyone else. What if there's someone here that's like that this morning or online? Say, Pastor, that's me. Would you pray for me? I'll see that hand and I'll pray for you. If you're online and you've never trusted Christ, there'll be a number on the screen. If someone by the phones right now who would love to open the Bible and show you how you can know for sure. Lord, bless this time of invitation for those who have lifted a hand to, Lord, be encouraged to remember what you've done. Would you help them? Lord, you've blessed them, but would you help them to remember your goodness, your blessing? It'd be on their lips. Lord, if there's someone here who's never trusted you, would you touch their heart today? Would they come forward and allow us to show them from the Bible how you love them? It's that your son, Jesus. Lord, bless the invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. The pianist is already playing. Stand to your feet if you would. The altar's open. As they play, God is so good. He's so good to me. If you need someone to pray with you, we have folks up here who would be glad to pray with you. If you don't know that you're on your way to heaven, we'd love to talk to you and have someone who can open a Bible. A man if you're a man, a lady if you're a lady. Folks are praying. Would you sing now? God is so good. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your scripture. Lord, help us to live for you. Help us to remember what you've done. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thanks for loving me. Well, thanks for sending your son, Jesus. Well, bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen.